four. Good evening and welcome to New York Symposium with Diane Sayre. Diane Sayre is an independent candidate for the United States Senate running against the Senator from Wall Street, Chuck Schumer, for the 2022 uh, United States Senate uh, position. Since sometime around about 1978, when the Three Mile Island incident occurred, nuclear power has been a primary point of contention and controversy in the United States. And tonight what we're gonna do is to begin a process of, shall we say, demythologizing that conflict and also a process of bringing you, the uh, participants in this symposium, into a kind of dialogue and hopefully uh, a battle to not only, quote, save nuclear power, but in fact, expand our country's uh, international and productive capabilities for the generation of advanced technologies. The map that we're going to show you now is a map of uh, the world uh, and a plan that was actually evolved from 1993 uh, through uh, recently. Uh, and it was called the World Land Bridge. The actual design we're showing you here was done by an engineer, uh, the late Hal Cooper, who had uh, participated in many of the conferences that Diane Sayre uh, and myself and others of us involved with both Lyndon LaRouche and also the Schiller Institute participated in this. This is his, essentially his design. Uh, what it's showing you is a series of what looked are or were called at the time rail lines, uh, but that doesn't just refer to high speed rail. What you're actually seeing, we don't have to go through each and every section of it, is the idea of what are called development corridors. You see, for example, uh, the North American continent, you see the United States on the, on the right of your screen and its connection into South America. You see a connection across the Bering Strait into Russia and then into therefore Asia and of course into Europe through Southwest Asia, Saudi Arabian Peninsula into Africa. This is not a design that is the, the first of its type, but the idea was that this set of development corridors, the development of the interior of continents would happen for the first time in human history. Never before has human development happened except primarily along the coastal areas and along riverbeds and, uh, and other bodies of water. Uh, the, the interior development of continents was something that became possible with the Transcontinental Railroad uh, as initiated by Abraham Lincoln in 1861. So the importance of showing you that map at this point as we go into our discussion is when we talk about energy needs, energy requirements, we're talking about the economy of Earth's next 50 to 100 years. We're not talking about what people think we need today. We're talking about planning for a future, a future which is going to see, as we've right now seen in the last uh, past week, uh, mankind in space uh, with a dialogue going on among China, the United Arab Emirates, and the United States right now around the planet Mars. And that's the same sort of dialogue of development, of economic development, that we are basically proposing go on in our relations among nations and our relations among one another uh, in the world. The events of last week in Texas underscored that the United States obviously is tremendously vulnerable when it comes to the question of power. Uh, and what we want to do is to have tonight the opportunity to present to you the reasons why a candidate for office, particularly for national office, ought to at least be competent in understanding what the parameters are for what is needed and also have the ability to bring together those persons that can best dialogue about how to get the United States on its feet and more than on its feet, make the United States once again a leader in advanced technologies and power generation technologies for the world. So we're gonna go first to Diane who will set up the discussion and then we'll introduce our panel. So Diane, uh, you're muted. Good, can I be heard now? Yes. Great, okay. So thanks for the introduction and thank you everybody for joining. What I wanna talk about a little bit is economy because I think unfortunately today, this is a science which is very poorly understood. And to get at that, I wanna talk about government uh, because 
I think that's something that's very poorly understood these days. And I would say if the government does not improve your conditions of life, that is the point of government, and it's particularly in the preamble to the US Constitution to promote the general welfare, and also includes for our posterity. If a government doesn't serve that purpose, then there is no reason to have it. And I think it's worth considering what life would be like if you did not have organized society. Albert Einstein wrote a very good paper about the individual and society, this paradox. If we took this idea of the rugged individualist to an extreme, so the things we take for granted like power lines, public streets, a sanitation system, if those things did not exist and we were all really on our own, first of all, you couldn't live in a neighborhood. Every person would need a huge area of land to sustain themselves and your life would probably be much shorter than it is now and much more miserable and you would find yourself spending 90% or more of your time just trying to figure out how to eat, stay warm, stay cool, survive, miss disasters, etc. And Benjamin Franklin actually not is not often quoted on this, but he had some very polemical things to say about people who didn't want to pay taxes. He said they shouldn't live in the town, they should go out in the woods and be barbarians uh, as they <laughs> deserved. So the purpose of human economy is actually not about money. There's a great confusion on this point. The purpose of human economy is to create the conditions where each generation has a higher standard of living than the generation before and that you want to create conditions where each generation can be more human than the previous one. What I mean by that is that you can spend less and less of your time worrying about basic physical needs and more and more of your time developing your mind, becoming a thinker, becoming a genius, whether it's in classical music or science or something that transforms the life of future generations. And when I say we have confusion today, Dennis already referenced what happened in Texas. People know you had 4.3 million people in this oil rich state who had no electricity, which of course then meant they had no running water. You had terrible crises in various areas, including even in hospitals. I think in uh, parts of Louisiana, you had 25% of the population still uh, without water. You had a 14 state area that had to have rolling blackouts. Um, and during this time in Texas, the people who had electricity found their electric bill went from $133 to $11,000. And people would say, well, isn't that good economics? You know, it's the law of supply and demand. You make the supply short, the demand increases, you can charge more. People might remember Enron, burn baby burn. They were cheering when fires gave them a pretext to shut off electricity and they could jack the price up 100 fold. Now LaRouche in 1996 developed something which he called the triple curve function. If you could please put that up. Um, that's LaRouche. Now you can see this curve here and over on the left side of the curve you have a red, green and gold line he said that was about the year 1966 where those three lines were together which is if you had an industry and the industry was growing uh that the physical economic output would go up at the same rate as its stock value the financial aggregates in other words these were not separate curves they were together but what happened was because of the deregulation of the economy, the very important shift, the Nixon taking the dollar off the gold reserve system so you could have floating exchange rates, suddenly it became not only possible, but what began to occur is that the financial aggregates, like Enron, for example, you're producing less electricity. So the physical output goes down 
the monetary aggregates, the amount of money floating around, the stock value goes up. So you had the bizarre situation where the worse your physical economy is, the higher your stock market was. And we are now at a point today where the higher the market is, the worse the economy is. Nobody in their right mind should run around talking about the great stock market as an indicator of an economic recovery. And what happens uh, when you get a hyperbolic function like this, you get to the asymptote where it goes vertical, it's a shock front. That's where the system blows out. That happened in 2008. Did we change our ways? No, we printed more money. We created another bubble and we won't deal with this too much today, but this is where part of this Green New Deal comes in because the carbon swaps, all of this stuff about is a, is a way of creating a new bubble, a new bubble to prop up the system. Now, <clears throat> what is the difference? We can take that down for a second between human beings and animals and animal economy. Well, if you have a bunch of rabbits and they just breed and breed and breed and you don't have any foxes or anything else that's going to eat them at a certain point they're going to eat all the grass they're going to consume all their food and they're going to starve to death i don't know if rabbits get violent and start attacking each other like rats who i haven't done this experiment but at a certain point they're going to die you can't get to um they don't make a breakthrough or discovery about how to get more food. They run out of resources and they die off. Um, can you show the population chart? Human population does not do this. Uh, what has happened, and this is perfectly natural. It is not unnatural. It is not a terrible threat to the universe that population is growing at a, um, a non-linear rate, a hyperbolic rate. These inflection points that are on the chart show where you had certain breakthroughs, certain discoveries. Lyndon LaRouche used to always like to talk about the guy who discovered how to use fire to cook his food, because obviously cooking your food was a vast improvement in sanitation and probably longevity at that point. Um, so discoveries were made, which made it possible for people to live longer, have a higher standard of living. And as Alexander Hamilton understood very well, is that when this happens, you need a greater division of labor. So you have more people, but you actually need more people. And what happens, so human beings are the only creature the only living being that can actually change our species characteristic as a matter of will. And in terms of energy, you can show the next chart. If you go from, say, burning wood, where you need a huge amount of fuel uh, for not that much energy, uh, and then you make a discovery of charcoal or coal and you discover that you can get a lot more energy from less. You get to oil and natural gas and a great discovery was nuclear fission and ultimately we should be at nuclear fusion. Um, what you see here, and please note, this is per capita energy consumption because just as population grows hyperbolically, it is actually necessary and good that energy consumption per capita grows at the same rate. If you think about what happened with Franklin Roosevelt's Rural Electrification Administration, which Wall Street vehemently opposed because they said we can see having lighting people's apartments in the city where they live close together, but we don't want to spend money for 40 miles of copper wire to get the electricity out to the farmhouse. But of course, what happened to the farmhouse when you had electricity? If you could control the lighting for your chickens, you could get them to lay a lot more eggs. If you could refrigerate the milk, you could store it longer. In other words, having electricity, electricity allowed you to increase geometrically 
your resources. Now, what this chart shows is that when we got to the point of the development of nuclear fission, uh, it was stopped. And Dennis just referenced Three Mile Island. Uh, you had the idea of Eisenhower, you had the idea of Adams for Peace, that we could eliminate poverty, that we could have massive, abundant, cheap, clean energy to develop the world. And instead, you got a terror campaign and a shutdown. Because in effect, what it means if people have access to this kind of energy is that the power of man over nature increases and the power of imperial colonial powers like the British Empire or the Dutch colonies or whatever becomes diminished. You can um, leave the chart there. Uh, so this is really what I wanted to get at is that um, human beings change by nature of a creative scientific discovery. You can take the chart down. That's all I'm seeing right now. Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and that is unique. No animal can do it. And contrary to what we've all been pretty much brainwashed to believe, it is not good to shrink. It is not good to consume less. It is not good to be quote unquote sustainable. If you stick with one resource and you don't change what you are doing, like suppose we decided to have combustion engines forever and ever and burn fossil fuels, well, at a certain point, you have to, you have to go farther and farther. You have to go more out of your way. The efficiency goes down, the cost increases, the safety decreases. In other words, you're creating something which is more and more physically expensive. And what that leads to is a reduction in the capacity to sustain your population. And the last thing I'll say is that LaRouche actually warned in the 1970s that if you impose this kind of shrinkage on the world, on the world economy, that you would end up with pandemic disease. Because when you grind down the standard of living, when you lower the possibility of sustaining human existence by lowering energy supply, water, and things like that, then you, cr then you have to increase the death rate. And we are in such a situation in many parts of the world today. And what we see is we're in that situation in the United States with what we just saw with these blackouts, which is completely insane. Everyone should think through what it would mean to not have energy, to not have electricity for an extended period of time. What would be the toll of that? So uh, I think that most human beings are not suicidal and that if people understand the nature of the problem and the actual potential of, of nuclear science, both fission and ultimately fusion, that we can completely transform the planet much for the better, but we have to move very quickly I think things are disintegrating at a rate much faster than a lot of us imagined possible. So again, thank you everyone for being here. That's what I would have to say in my opening remarks. Okay, very good. So we're just gonna now introduce the entire panel if we can bring them all up. Uh, we have Teresa Knickerbocker, who is the mayor of Buchanan, New York, otherwise known as the home of the Indian Point nuclear power plant. Uh, around which there's been a controversy going on ever since 1979 or even a bit, a bit before that. Uh, Dr. Jerry Cutler, who is a uh, nuclear scientist and professional engineer, consultant in nuclear energy and radiation health effects. And he worked uh, from 1974 on 25 can-do can reactors. I think that's Canada deuterium oxide and uranium, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, and uh, he's been providing uh, services to nuclear power plants. He's a consultant in nuclear energy and radiation health effects and so forth. Uh, we also have with us Eric Dawson, the co-founder of Nuclear New York, which is a nonpartisan 501c3 promoting the importance of nuclear energy. Uh, from Illinois, I believe, we've got Nick Kotler, uh, who is with the United Brotherhood of Carpenters, Local 58. Uh, and is going to talk about what's going on out there with the Byron and Dresden plants in Illinois. 
the attempts to shut those plants down, uh, although there's a lot of pushback going on on that right now. And then there's Bruce Todd, who's a millwright, local 715. Uh, he's here in New, from New Jersey. Uh, he worked on, he's, he built, he's built nuclear plants, and I think he also worked down to Three Mile Island, if I'm not mistaken. So what we're going to do is want to thank all of you, first of all, for being here with us. We're going to start with the mayor, since uh, she's sitting right there in the hot seat, uh, and uh, a seat that's been hot for a long time. I just want to say, Mayor Nickelbacher, as we bring you on, we used to know and uh, worked with, for a period of time, uh, your predecessor, Mayor George Begany with oh, whom we did, uh -huh. yeah, 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 back in 1982, 83, 84. Matter of fact, we did a couple of meetings with him uh, up in uh, Buchanan in support of the plant back then. So uh, welcome tonight and go right ahead with whatever you'd like to say. Okay, so I'm, I'm not gonna take a lot of your time because there's many other people that need to speak, but I just wanna give you a basic overview um, we, uh, our unit one went online in 1962. So we were basically one of the first commercial uh, nuclear power plants in the country. Uh, unit two and three were built after that. And um, what, you know, it's built on 240 acres on the beautiful Hudson River. And um, for years we had anti-nuclear people that um, campaigns, campaigned against it. And um, I, the community really didn't get involved that much. Um, I don't think they thought it would ever happen, but uh, 2000, January of 2017, it finally happened. Um, the governor and Entergy and Riverkeeper signed an agreement to close the plants. But the background on that, um, what you have to understand is that Entergy for 10 years tried to get a water certificate. It cost them $10 million a year and it didn't look like a water certificate was in sight. The price of gas went down and it's kind of interesting now to see gas prices are going back up and they will continue to climb. So I think it was um, the constant campaigning of fear mongering, fear mongering, fear mongering. And if I had to look back and say how one could stop a nuclear power plant to be closed. Um, I, I wish I knew many of you people in 2015, 2016, but I think it's about education. I think it's about educating people that it is not this Fukushima thing. It is not this scary. I've been in the plant many, many times. I've been on different tours. I will give Entergy kudos. They run a tight ship at this plant. Um, the people that work there, top shelf people, they live in the community, um, you know, so it was, it was just the anti-nuclear campaign. And <clears throat> what I find most interesting in a sick, twisted way is that these people call themselves environmentalists. But what replaced Unit 2 was a thousand megawatt um, gas fired plant. And what will replace um, April 30th, we have unit three, our other unit closing, um, and that will also be replaced by a gas fired plant. So I can't stress enough the education of, of the community, uh, the education of uh, elected officials. Um, it's not this big scary monster. monster. Uh, the people in the community did not fear it. Um, and what you have are people from outside the area that are basically telling you what's good for you and what's not good for you. So I am not a nuclear expert. I have no education in nuclear. I have never worked in a nuclear power plant, but at least I can honestly say that to you. But the anti-nuclear people in the same token do not have that education. So it's just a sad situation. With the closing of this plant, we are losing half of our revenue. We are losing a thousand very good paying jobs and we're losing a very good corporate neighbor, not only to the village of Buchanan, but throughout Westchester County. Entergy, and I will say this to the day I die, was an excellent corporate neighbor. They um, gave out money to many different organizations, many different municipalities. So it, they're going, our library, our school, so they're gonna be very much missed. This is something we are just not gonna be able to replace. But once again, it, we, didn't, we didn't fear this plant. 
So, you know, it's a sad day for us on April 30th. Um, we were always known as one of the smallest communities with nuclear power plants. So that was our identity. So, you know, that's just not gonna be there anymore. But I, I would also say not only the education, but it is so important in this country. And I don't know who has to get through to our elected officials and higher levels that you cannot rely on one source of energy. Uh, nuclear is great. There's zero carbon emissions. Um, but you know what? There's got to be a, a, some type of a mix in the portfolio. So yes, if you want, if you want um, solar panels, that's great. That could be a percentage. You want this, you want that. But nuclear is the only one that is reliable. And for the security of our country, you need reliable power. And I don't know why people are not getting this. If Texas wasn't an indication of what could happen, that could cripple this country. I mean, I'm understanding, you know, the cold, I'm understanding the, the, the windmill thing. I get all that, but also our structure, our, um, our grid is in tough shape. So there is a combination of things. I, I think once again, it's the campaigning of no, we got to go renewable, 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 but we're not there yet. Maybe 20 years from now, we could add that more into the portfolio. But for now, the answer is not cutting nuclear completely out of the equation. That's ridiculous. It's a security issue. And it's just a quality of life issue for people in general. And that's, that's where I am here in Buchanan and what the future is. I, I will be very honest with you. I think it's too late for Indian Point. If I saw a sliver of hope on some way that we could keep that plan open, I'd be on that. But the problem is there was an agreement made between the governor, the state of New York, uh, Entergy and Riverkeeper. And the only options to get out of the closure of the plant was either war, and we don't want to see that. Nobody wants to see that. And the other thing is um, if there wasn't the power supply that was needed. So with the other gas plant going online May 1st, that takes care of that. And the Public Service Commission feels strongly that we will have the power needed. Um, one of the other things I kind of laughed at is that they were saying um, the P PSC is people would would um, like use less electricity. Well, you know, I'm not seeing that. In the middle of winter, I am not turning my thermostat down. I am not doing it. In the middle of summer, I am not turning my air conditioning down. I am not going to conserve. And I'm not somebody who's so different. The average American likes their comforts. Why am I going to have my thermostat on 55 to conserve electricity? Because you can't supply that to me. So if I sound angry, I am very angry of what happened to this community. This didn't have to happen. And I think planning for the future, I don't think that's part of the equation. I think, um, I think the elected officials are, are listening to these people with renewable. I don't have a problem with renewable, don't get me wrong. Nuclear is reliable. Windmills, um, the, uh, the solar panels, not so much. So I, I don't know, it's, it's once again about education. It's, it's, that's, you know, that's where I am with this. It's um, like I said, it's gonna be a very sad day for us, but I don't see any way out of this. Um, they're running low on fuel. The last refueling was two years ago and they're scheduled for April 30th. All right, Mayor, well, thank you very much. What we're gonna do, we're gonna hear from a number of other people okay. who of course have a lot of things to say and maybe you'll see light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps in what has, what's being discussed as we go along. Dr. Cutler, I'd like to go to you next. Uh, you may be, okay, go ahead. You're still muted. There Is that go. better? Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me. 
Uh, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about Canada first, and then we go on to talk about Indian Point. I think you can learn a few things about what happens in Canada. Uh, Canada is divided into 10 provinces. Four of them uh, are mostly hydro. British Columbia, Manitoba, Quebec is all hydro, and Newfoundland's got hydro. Four of them are mostly fossil. That's Alberta, they're in the oil sands, and uh, Saskatchewan, a lot of oil there. Nova Scotia needs oil, they use fossil. And Prince Edward Island, they have no other option. Now, two provinces, the two remaining ones, Ontario and New Brunswick, they have nuclear reactors. Now, New Brunswick is one third nuclear, one third hydro, and one third fossil. So well, they have one reactor. Ontario has 20 reactors. 60% of the electricity is nuclear, 30% is hydro, and 10% is gas and renewables or unreliables. And uh, what happens is when the, uh, they give wind priority, uh, but uh, when it doesn't uh, deliver, gas uh, moves up and down and if necessary, uh, the nuclear plants will change too. Now, uh, the nuclear plants are owned by the people of Ontario. They're owned by the province, province provincial government. So it's like uh, TVA perhaps. And we also own the used fuel. So there's no big issue about the, who owns the, the waste, uh, we do. Uh, Ontario, as I mentioned, has 20 reactors. There's two operating companies, Ontario Power Generation and Bruce Power. Now, uh, Ontario Power Generation has eight Pickering reactors and four at Darlington. Bruce Power has eight reactors, Bruce A, four, and Bruce B, four. Now, two of the Pickering units are shut down. So there's actually 18 reactors operating. Now, we had a time when uh, Bruce A, uh, they needed to be refurbished. The plants were old and they needed an overhaul and there was no money to do it. So they were shut down and they were down for 10 years. Now, along came Bruce Power and they, this is a company that wanted to be an operator. So they negotiated a contract with uh, Ontario government and uh, part of the, uh, to operate the eight reactors. Now, part of the deal was uh, they were going to uh, uh, refurbish the four reactors that were shut down, but uh, that was gonna cost billions of dollars. So they said, look, uh, we cannot do this unless you guarantee us a fixed price for the electricity we're gonna sell and, and give us a market because uh, the only way we can do this is we have to go to um, pension funds, investments. We have to borrow money from them, billions of dollars, and we have to assure them that we'll repay it plus interest. Now, the only way they can guarantee that they will be able to repay those, that debt was they needed assurance uh, that they would get a fixed uh, revenue, at least minim minimum, if, if it's, more than uh, that's good. But so they guaranteed uh, a price of eight cents a kilowatt hour, which is quite uh, low actually, but it was guaranteed. Not only that, they guaranteed uh, that they would buy the electricity. So uh, the, these reactors were uh, refurbished and they're running. And the Bruce B reactors are also running. Now the Bruce B reactors need to be refurbished and they're gonna do the same thing they're going to get uh, a loan uh, from uh, investors and they're going to get a guarantee on the price that they're going to sell electricity and they will proceed uh, one by one to refurbish. So we're going to be refurbishing uh, another four reactors. Now, Darlington reactors are also being refurbished because they're old. All these plants are over 30 years and our reactors, they have pressure tubes in them and they degrade with time and uh, so we retube the reactors. It's like what you do to a car when you do an overhaul, you uh, polish the cylinders and uh, well, that's the way we used to do them. <laughs>
overhaul the engines. So um, they, each reactor has a license. Uh, the, we have a regulator like your NRC is Canal, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And uh, they uh, had to, um, the license for Pickering, the eighth reactor site um, was uh, at its end and they wanted to extend it for another 10 years. So uh, they had a public hearing because this is a very controversial subject. So I uh, applied to be a paid intervener. I received uh, funding and uh, there were a hundred interveners at the public hearing, a hundred of them. 50 of them wanted to shut the plant down immediately, all eight reactors. And the other 50 were arguing in favor of uh, the license, the 10 year license. And uh, the issue was uh, they wanted to shut the reactors down in 2025 because they were saying that the, the uh, pressure tubes uh, were likely to um, crack because uh, the ref they hadn't been uh, refurbished. And the, the problem with refurbishing Pickering is each reactor is small. It's 500 megawatts, whereas the Darlington ones and the Bruce ones are 900 megawatts. So it's a question of economics. So uh, when I came to the hearing, I, I explained them two things. One is the pressure tubes, even if they fail, even if they crack, it's not a safety issue and it won't damage the fuel and it won't release radioactivity to the environment. I gave them those facts and uh, they, uh, <laughs> the owner, in fact, Ontario Power agreed that I was right. So the other point I made was that even if there was an accident or a release or a damage that released radioactivity, the radiation dose to the surrounding residents would be so low, it would not be harmful. And not only that, it would be beneficial. It would actually be a health benefit because I understand the health effects of radiation. And I know for a fact, I have the evidence that low doses of radiation are actually beneficial. Now, this is not known to the public and a lot of the people, very controversial subject. So it's a problem of uh, lack of knowledge of the biology of uh, radiation on health. And uh, there was a myth that was created way back at the time of uh, the Second World War in Hiroshima and Nagasaki when they were bombed. They wanted to create a scare. And so um, they created a, a link between radiation and cancer. And that link has been there for us since then. And uh, we know that that's incorrect and it's very controversial to argue against it. Anyhow, this is the basis for a lot of the anti-nuclear opposition. A lot of their opposition is economic, of course. They wanna bring in uh, uh, windmills, they wanna bring in more gas fire generation. So you have a combination of, uh, well, there's economic incentives to shut down nuclear and they're using the radiation scare as part of the reason for doing this. Anyhow, my presentation is uh, on the record. It's in the public record and uh, it was accepted. In fact, I asked the regulator to revise the radiation protection regulations and he admitted that I was correct, but he said, I'm not gonna change anything until the international medical community accepts the fact that low doses of radiation are not harmful, in fact, beneficial. So uh, that's where I'll end on that. But what I wanted to say is, even though the reactors were shut down for 10 years at Bruce, uh, they were able to refurbish them and put them back into operation. So as long as you don't tear the plant apart, uh, you can uh, uh, bring it back. Now, uh, let's go on to Indian Point. Uh, again, there's uh, an anti-nuclear political movement and it's all through North America, Canada and the US. And their objective, they want to shut down all the nuclear plants uh, and they want to phase out nuclear energy in the US. Uh, there's a hundred reactors there and they're going after them one after another. Now, Indian Point is an easy target. Why? because they had this accident in Fukushima in 2011. 
And what happened there? There was a huge evacuation because of the radiation scare. So now people are arguing, well, gee, if we had a, some kind of event in uh, Indian Point, the radioactive fallout or the material would go to New York City. We can't evacuate New York City, so we're going to sh uh, shut down the plant. So uh, if you want to argue to keep uh, the reactors operating, you somehow got to persuade people that there's no risk to New York City. Now, uh, a Fukushima accident is not likely to happen in Indian Point. It just, there's no tidal waves. The only thing that could produce that kind of an accident would be a meteor hit, a direct meteor hit. <laughs> and that's not credible. So really, there, there really is no argument, a point for saying that the nuclear reactors in uh, Indian Point are going to have that sort of damage. So this whole uh, safety issue of uh, risk to New York City is bogus. Now, uh, what happens is people, they want to shut down. There's pressure put on the government. People work out deals. Now, the reactor is owned by a private company. It's not uh, your TVA uh, ownership. So if, some, if someone gives them an offer, a good offer, they're happy to sell it. So uh, Entergy can sell it to, uh, what do you call that company? Holtec. And Holtec will get, Enter Energy will get money, and Holtec will get money to decommission it. So the plant owners, they make money, but the people lose. And uh, they end up paying more for unreliable electricity, or, uh, either because it's windmills or the price of gas or its availability is unreliable. So uh, the solutions, I think, are you've got to find a way where the government can own those plants, and you've got to assure a fixed price for the electricity. Otherwise, you can't raise the funds to refurbish it because no nuclear plant owner uh, can spend money refurbishing or operating a plant if you can't guarantee them a reasonable return. So uh, that's all what it comes down to. These plants are very expensive. And the government, I think, uh, the other issue that comes up with the plant is uh, you have used fuel coming out of it. And some people claim that this is, uh, there's no solution to the problem of use of waste, nuclear waste. And that's, uh, first, it's not nuclear waste. And secondly, uh, it's very safe to store it in containers. So again, you're dealing with uh, emotional anti-nuclear propaganda. And uh, it's got to be uh, responded with knowledge by knowledgeable scientists. So that's my uh, submission, my presentation. I hope I've covered the subject. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Doc. And we're going to go to uh, Eric Dawson, co-founder of Nuclear New York. Make sure you've unmuted. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear okay. you. Great. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, again, my name is Eric Dawson, and I co-founded an organization called Nuclear New York. Uh, we are a nonpartisan, not-for-profit environmentalist organization promoting the preservation and expansion of nuclear energy to reduce air pollution and carbon emissions. And as we're nonpartisan, we don't formally endorse any political candidates, but we really want to reach out to all different kinds of people with our message, whether left, left right, or center. Um, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about me, I got into this field, I'm not from a science background, but I've always been in favor of reducing environmental problems, but at the same time, I was very frustrated by the efforts from most activists in the field demanding that people reduce their quality of life, i.e. through banning cheap electricity and ultimately curtailing people's freedoms. Um, and you find a lot of hypocrisy in the field also. Quite a few activists famously lecture middle-class families about driving SUVs while they themselves are traveling in limousines and private jets and mega yachts. Uh, so I only endorse solutions that do not reduce the quality of life for average people at all. Uh, and that has led me to promote nuclear energy. Um, 
And as I see it, the major problem in the public energy policy debate and the legislation that's put forth is that the, the debate is framed as a binary. It's renewables versus fossil fuels. But we feel that energy policy is actually non-binary. Uh, there's a third option, nuclear. Um, and this third option is carbon-free, conveniently. Um, and there's really no reason for a fanatical devotion to any particular technology. We should simply use what works and nuclear actually works. Um, and in the real world of millions of people living nearly century long lifespans in first world modern countries, we can't simply ban fossil fuels to eliminate all pollution. It's just not realistic, it's not possible. Um, instead, we must gradually displace fossil fuels in a market through substitution. Now, famously, the energy source with the most negative externalities is coal. But if you look at the past 20 years, the great reduction in coal has come about not through banning it, but through displacing it in a market by expanding natural gas. And this is overall a good thing. There are problems with gas, but there are fewer problems with gas than with coal. This is always a would you rather game. There is no utopia. And so if we want to reduce gas, ultimately we have to displace it by expanding some other energy source. And we think it should be nuclear. Um, nuclear is the best of both worlds. It has the reliability and efficiency of fossil fuels, but the absence of air pollution and carbon emissions. There are also other less obvious uh, environmental concerns like land use and material, material use, as far as concrete and steel, these sort of things. And if you compare by, elect, by energy unit that is produced, nuclear is actually vastly better than any other source in those ways. They have the lowest land use intensity and the lowest material intensity. And this actually aids uh, towards uh, wildlife conservation, which was really the goal of kind of the original environmentalists of the early 20th century, people like Teddy Roosevelt. Um, but uh, as other speakers have touched on, the worst part of renewables are their intermittents. And ultimately we are fragilizing our electric grid by increasing intermittent energy sources. Something will be needed to compensate and that something is fossil fuels, usually gas. Um, and so I would say in New York State, ultimately more intermittent wind and solar means more baseload natural gas. There's no way around it. And every major case study of phasing out nuclear power has resulted ironically in increased carbon emissions for this reason. You can look up especially Germany, uh, but also in Vermont and California. Um, and many rich countries with the cleanest air heavily rely on nuclear power. Um, countries like Canada, but also uh, France, Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, many others. Um, I would also like to bring up uh, these kind of definitions to kind of break through the kind of uh, rigidity of the public debate. Um, that when we think of uh, what is the definition of renewable, although nuclear energy is not technically renewable because it requires uranium, it requires so little uranium, and we could extract this from the ocean in the future, that we could likely supply the entire world on nuclear alone for thousands of years. And even if you ignore the problem of intermittence, although solar and wind are technically renewable, the you know uh, lights don't turn on magically just when the sun is out and when the wind blows. Solar panels and wind turbines have such a high material intensity that they have to be replaced every 20 or 30 years, and they require the mining of rare minerals that is transported via fossil fuels around the world. Um, and just to touch on the common objections to nuclear, uh, I would argue that they are ultimately relatively weak if you consider the totality of evidence. There's a low risk of meltdown. Nuclear power has been used for over 60 years. It exists in over 400 countries. I I'm sorry, it, there's 400 plants in over 30 countries. Um, yet there's only been three major accidents and two of those resulted in zero, zero deaths from radiation. The only really tragic one famously was Chernobyl in 1986, but Upon looking at it, and I encourage you to read more about this, it was really an indictment of the Soviet system, not the technology itself. Um, but each, each accident, each problem, each negative externality has to be balanced with the positives. Um, so even if you look at something like Fukushima, the accident in 2011, the, even though there's zero deaths, there was economic damage, but you have to balance it out with the fact that this provided millions of Japanese people with clean electricity for 40 years. And this is in East Asia where air pollution is really a, a problem that actually harms people. Um, the other uh, objection people talk about is, is storage, um, but there's also low risk. Um, 
Most nuclear waste is kept in thick concrete casts above ground, and in the future, most will likely be be uh, moved beneath the surface. Um, it's actually a pretty simple solution. And all nuclear waste that has ever been created in the U.S. could fit inside one football field. You kind of think of a football field as being big, but compared to the rest of the country, this is infinitesimal. Um, and only, only nuclear energy is required to account for all of its waste by the Department of Energy, unlike any other energy source. Um, so one thing that uh, if you remember nothing else other than this, I would encourage everybody at home to look up on the internet deaths per energy source and deaths per, per electricity unit by energy source. Uh, often these graphs are deaths per kilowatt hour or terawatt hour, but that is really the best way to evaluate energy sources. It, it's not just uh, you know looking at one incident or imagining some tragic situation. You have to balance how much electricity was produced uh, by uh, per death that actually results. Um, and uh, you'll find that nuclear is at the bottom of the list. It's on par with renewables in terms of deaths per energy unit. Um, by some measures, it's even lower than renewables. Um, but unlike renewables, it, nuclear has the ability to scale to the level that is needed. So nuclear has clearly saved infinitely more lives than it has ever taken. Nuclear saves lives. Um, and as far as New York, there are three functioning plants in upstate that are still going, but the one that we're worried about is downstate, that's Indian Point. And Indian Point provides a significant minority, but still a minority of New York City's electricity, but it provides a majority, a vast majority of its clean electricity, meaning no air pollution, no carbon emissions. And unfortunately, it is scheduled to shut down April 30th of this year. Um, and people can debate the severity of these different environmental problems, but for any politicians or activists or concerned citizens who think that global warming is an emergency, that air pollution is an emergency, that the COVID-19 pandemic is an emergency that's exacerbated by air pollution, then based on these emergencies alone, New York State should keep nuclear plants like Indian Point open. Um, and we think uh, that uh, every place should embrace it, but uh, especially New York, uh, nuclear saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Nick Cockler. Yeah, um, thank you for inviting me uh, this uh, evening. Uh, appreciate all the uh, input here uh, uh, from uh, the mayor and from uh, our friend up in Canada and from uh, nuclear uh, New York there. Um, I live here in uh, Illinois, about 75 miles northwest of Chicago, uh, about 20 miles uh, from the Wisconsin border. And ever since I've lived out here for 30 years, every watt of electricity uh, we've used has come from the Byron nuclear plant. Uh, very safe, very reliable. The only time we lost any power was when a car ran into a telephone pole, knocked the line over and they got it up and running shortly. Um, we had the news recently, well, I guess it's been a little while now that uh, they wanted to close both the Byron and the Dresden plants. Uh, this has gone on now, this has been twice. They've scared everybody. A few years ago, they had the same threat and uh, the Illinois state legislature was able to um, come up with a formula to throw a few dollars on everybody's uh, electric bill to keep those plants open. So that worked out for a few years and now uh, it's all blowing up in one way because uh, the Speaker of the House who is the longest uh, tenured Speaker of the House in US history, uh, he's implicated in bribing Commonwealth Edison uh, for that type of legislation. So again, political problems that uh, are always there and uh, people get that news but they don't get any of the news like we've heard from uh, the nuclear expert in Canada, nor the co-founder of Nuclear New York. People, I agree with what the uh, mayor said, education is the key because the information that people are getting is um, just awful. They don't understand that here in Illinois, uh, there's 11 reactors at six different sites uh, that produces 50% of the electrici electricity in Illinois, uh, and it produces 95% of the clean energy that Eric mentioned. Uh, the rest of the coal and gas-fired and the other things 
and there's wind farms here and solar panels and things of that nature uh, that have a uh, supplement. But like we know, and we've heard, the supplements are intermittent and then they need to build some backup capacity for that. And um, those contribute, like we've heard, to the pollution problem, which then you have this vicious circle that exacerbates the problem and everybody is pointing fingers, but the reality that the amount of energy in uranium way surpasses the amount of energy in anything else that can produce a type of electricity you need in a modern society. Um, both uh, the, the Dresden and the Byron plants that are scheduled to be closed. One is, uh, like I said, northwest of Chicago. The other one is southeast of Chicago. Um, they provide uh, in the neighborhood of 1,500 full-time employment. And when there's outages and uh, maintenance to be done, it boosts the um, employment up to uh, 2,000 people. That um, type of input for the local communities, let's see here, I jotted it down. Um, on average, uh, each of the uh, six sites that I mentioned with the 11 reactors uh, provides $40 million in payroll to the employees and $470 million in uh, spending to the local uh, goods and services. On top of that, there's another $136 million in local, tackle, local taxes that goes directly uh, to the schools in that area, the roads, law enforcement, uh, the type of services that people expect. And as the mayor uh, mentioned earlier, that's gonna be lost. And how do you make that up? It's, those people are in a terrible situation here. We have a little bit of time here in Illinois uh, because uh, they're not scheduled to be uh, decommissioned uh, until uh, the fall. And my understanding is they haven't submitted their petition to FERC for the decommissioning. So that's a big issue here. I had, uh, I've been a nuclear um, energy proponent for many, many years. And I just kind of follow it. But now I decided to kind of get in the fight uh, to try to help and do things, not just now, but like Dennis mentioned, what's it going to be like 20, 30, 50 years from now? You know, uh, are we going to have like 1 billion people like some people would like to like the population to collapse? Or are we going to have growth? I mean, I, I have a great life. I turn the switch on, the lights come on, I turn the heat on, it's great. I get in my little spaceship and I drive where I wanna go. This, you know, this is great. And it should be available to everybody, but we have these political concerns. Now, what happened to me and why, one of the reasons I got involved, quick story is a couple of years ago, they were gonna put a solar farm near my house. I live in kind of beyond the suburbs. Uh, there's uh, some, large communities out here, but basically a lot of farms and stuff. So there was a petition or there was a little sign on the road, a zoning board hearing. Uh, they wanted to reclassify the zoning from agriculture to something else to put in the solar farm. And I went to the uh, McHenry County uh, zoning board meeting. Uh, there were a couple things on the agenda. One was a solar farm that was further along in the process of getting uh, approval and there was the one that I was concerned with. Uh, there was a gentleman there who was a, uh, a uh, consultant for an in, in environmental engineering company. And I recognized his name because he used to be the McHenry County Board Chairman. And when he retired from being the McHenry County Board Chairman, he became a state legislator. And he was one of those rare politicians that said, if I get reelected three times, then I'm done. And he walked away from it and became a consultant. Anyway, in his presentation uh, at the discussion of these solar farms, he said something that surprised me and it shocked 
all the uh, zoning board members. He said, these solar farms are small potatoes. You should be concerned if they close the nuclear plant down the road that supplies electricity to millions of people. The people at the zoning board, they all look like deer in headlights. No, disparag no disparagement meant, but they just, like the mayor said, people are uneducated. Everybody wants to feel good about putting in a solar farm or putting in a windmill, but they don't understand how actually backward thinking that is. Anyway, uh, I thought I would uh, say, give that little bit of background. And then uh, I followed up with uh, that environmental engineer this week. I figured, okay, I'll, I'll touch base with him, uh, see if he remembers me at all. I sent him an email talk, asking him if he was interested in uh, talking about the Byron uh, situation. And to my surprise, his uh, assistant emailed me back almost the same day. And then she said, you'd be better off talking to Mike. And so I called him on the phone. He says, I'm busy now. I'll call you back in 15 minutes. He was on the phone with me for about 35, maybe 40 minutes. And I was very impressed because the first thing he said, yes, we should keep the nuclear generating capacity. It's an essential part of the mix. And then he went into, when he was in the legislature, how all these bills for the deregulation and the pricing of electricity and all these things worked. So I think this guy is a great source to continue to work with to bring the educated, uh, the necessary education to the uh, folks that uh, are willing to listen. So that's what I got to say. Thanks again for inviting me and having uh, this discussion. It's great. Okay, very good. So Bruce, we are now, Bruce, you are the caboose. <laughs> okay, good evening. And, and thanks to everybody. Uh, a lot's been said so far. Um, so um, I want to go back to actually what uh, Diane had started to talk about in the beginning about economic development. Because if you look where the beginnings of the nuclear industry started in the country, they had originally gone on uh, the idea that we were going to have a certain quality and quantity of growth and development in the country. Out of that came the idea that we actually were going to need 250 nuclear plants just for the United States itself. Now, we haven't seen that. Um, and you can see that directly because of the the conditions, the state of affairs of most of the former industrial areas of the country, uh, which not you, is not just even the Midwest, it stretches all the way into New Jersey, to California, mm -hmm. to the Southwest, you know, places like, uh, uh, you know, Santa Fe, St. Louis, all of these areas were major industrial centers. And if you consider the type of growth and development that should have gone on, you wouldn't see what you see in those areas right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've, worked, uh, I've worked in quite a few of the nuclear plants. I wanna go back a little bit, say for example, Oyster Creek, which is the, I only live about a mile from the now uh, shut down Oyster Creek nuclear power plant, which Holtec is starting to disassemble. Um, if you went into that plant, the, the, uh, the, the way the plant was put together based on the original plans that were designed is very, I'm not gonna say haphazard, but it's old, it's old in technology, okay? If, I, if you went into some of the newer plants that I worked in, like at the uh, artificial island, uh, which is uh, run by PSENG, Salem 1, Salem 2, and the Hope Creek plant, they are entirely different. They, they have a much more modern feel to them, design, uh, quality of uh, energy output. So you, you could see the, the direction that they were going with that. Um, 
but also artificial island only has three nuclear plants, whereas the original design was for six nuclear plants. Right here at Oyster Creek, there was only one, but it was designed for two. There was actually an island that was going to be built off Atlantic City with two nuclear plants on it. Now, this just gives you an idea of the, of the scale of development that they were uh, uh, visualizing in, what, in the direction the country was going. Um, let me get up to the newer type, which is where we should be really discussing the new uh, 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 modular, small modular reactors, pebble bed type reactors. All of these are the type of reactors that should be being built right now to uh, offset what, you, what was being said about the use of coal and oil, et cetera. If you had had 250 nuclear power plants in the country, you wouldn't even be discussing mining for coal, drilling for oil. You know, we would, we would be, uh, well, let me, let me put it another way. If you look at what just happened with the Perseverance rover on Mars, right? If you think of the quality of the technology involved in that, and you applied that to the building and developing of nuclear power plants now, now you're getting a real sense of what should be going on. Instead of the talk about shutting down, you know, Indian Point or Byron or any, anywhere else. Clearly these plants can continue to run. Most of the fleet of nuclear plants in the country probably within the last 20 years, have had major refurbishing going on. I worked on some of those, like over at the Salem 1 and 2 plants. They did a lot of that. They created uh, better efficiencies, a better output, uh, more longevity in the, in the cycle of operation, where it used to be only one year, you get two years out of a refueling of the plants. So there's constantly been upgrading, but now we're, we're on the verge of where we should be really stepping into a whole new realm of development in nuclear power. And, um, you know, there's whole areas that we even haven't even uh, gone into that was planned for. Things like desalinization of water. At one time, the Atomic Energy uh, uh, the, uh, Commission had designed a nuclear power plant strictly for desalinization of, of water that was designed to, to produce enough water for the entirety of Los Angeles County of California, desalinating water from the Pacific versus what happened a couple of years ago with water shortages all over California, massive wildfires. So, that's the uh, that's the, the real idea I think that we've got to be discussing and should be discussing with other countries. You know, the the uh, potential is is so great for the use of nuclear power. Um, just to touch on one other thing, which is the uh, the so-called nuclear waste question. Years and years ago, back in the 70s, there was a. Uh, Congress had signed legislation to build a uh, reprocessing plant, which never was never followed through with. So instead of that one football field of so-called nuclear waste, 99% of that can be reprocessed for reuse, whether it's in fuel or in medical isotopes, all kinds of isotopes. So now shrink that football field by 99%. And that's the actual, you know, so-called waste problem with nuclear energy. It can be reused. So um, I, I think that's uh, really the direction we've got to look at in this thing. It's not that we have to save a few plants, but, but we can actually uh, those that aren't refurbished yet should be refurbished. 
The ones that are scheduled for closure should never be closed. If you look at Texas, there's, a, there's the perfect example of why they shouldn't be closed. And we should be moving on to other areas of use of nuclear power, both here on Earth and in the, and in the galaxy we're looking at up above us, right? For uh, both fission power in uh, rockets and fusion. Those are, the, those are the areas that we really need to be going into. So um, I, I'm going to leave it at that. I think people have had a lot to say already around that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bruce. We have a lot of questions that have come in and uh, we'll have to decide. Diane, we're obviously going to have to extend this uh, discussion. Um, so I think what I'll do is I will pose a couple of the questions that have come in. Just prior to that, I'd just like to point out, uh, so as everybody is aware of this, this is an article from the American Nuclear Society. In total, it, it appears that 30 plants, that is nuclear plants, coal plants, petroleum, and others, will be retired in 2021. Five nuclear reactors are included in the closure list. Indian Point, three, uh, uh, Byron, two units at that plant, and Dresden, two units at the plant. These, those three plants produce 5.1 gigawatts of power, accounting for more than half of the total capacity expected to be retired. There have been recent reports, however, that the state of Illinois could legislate support for Exelon, which would result in their Byron and Dresden plants being saved from an earlier early retirement. Doing so would keep 4.1 gigawatts of carbon-free power on the grid. So actually, I would argue that there's a serious possibility, uh, depending on what we find we are actually capable of doing, of preventing any of this from happening. However, to do so would require that we have a, uh, the kind of dialogue that we're having here tonight with a lot of other people and rather quickly. Um, so let me just go to a couple of the, uh, uh, of the questions. Uh, I'm going to try to do two questions at a time because there's about eight or nine questions in the, in the chat room right now. And because of time, um, I'm going to ask that they be addressed by one primary person who would ever would like to do it. And then... Um, we can, uh, and if somebody else has something to add, just put up your hand and then we'll try to take it. Um, first, before I go to that, Diane, let me ask you, do you have anything you want to say at this point? Well, I presume you're going to uh, take up the questions of radiation and let Dr. Cutler say a few things about that and low level radiation, which I hope he will do because I've seen several things coming in also on Facebook of the hysteria about everyone's going to get cancer and die. Um, I just want to say again, as I said at the beginning, that one of the worst axioms that's crept into the way most people think is that something is bad about growth. Growth is human and if you try and stop it, you will die. And I'll just um, use one example, which is that in the LaRouche organization, uh, actually Helga Zepp LaRouche had commissioned a study on what would be required to get every nation on the planet to a decent standard, minimum standard of health care. So you could do something about this pandemic and so you could prevent future viruses from becoming pandemics. Suppose you took the Hilburton standard of 4.5 hospital beds per 1,000 population. We no longer have that in the US. We're at about 2.6 hospital beds per 1,000. Um, so just in the US alone, we calculated, I forget how many more hospitals that you need, but hospitals need an enormous, enormous amount of energy. There's oxygen, there's refrigeration, there's sterilization, there's all kinds of machines that people are running, they need a lot of energy. And we calculated that you would need to build about 15 new nuclear power plants, and I think decent sized ones, or a series of smaller modular ones, just to have the energy above what we have now to have the hospital capacity that you would need to get the US back up to the Hilburton standard of, of care. So uh, that's just one example. So the idea of shrinking, and I was so glad uh, that the mayor brought up this question of not conserving or telling everyone use less, consume less. 
if you do that to the population, you're going to increase the death rate. It's just unnatural and it's not necessary. And the irony is that the more that you increase your energy consumption, not arbitrarily, but in terms of raising the standard of living of people, the more efficient you are, the more efficient you are with your resources and actually be, people become healthier, they live longer, your society is healthier and there is no such thing as status quo. You cannot pick a platform and remain there. So you're either gonna completely collapse and at a certain point it becomes hyperbolic or you're going to grow. But the idea of remaining at some fixed thing is just a complete fiction. The universe doesn't work that way. Nothing works that way. And we have to have a policy that reflects that. So. Again, I, I really want to thank everyone. This is such an incredible panel of people who know a great deal. And thank everyone for participating. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now read a couple of the questions. Uh, and these will be the first couple I think Dr. Cutler can deal with and anyone else who wants to ask, answer them. Uh, one is, can you please provide the material you have on the levels studied of radiation uh, that is beneficial? Also, what do you think of replacing the old plants with the new fourth generation nuclear plants? I think she's talking about pebble bed reactors and such. Okay, so that's one. Then there's just a question from Facebook, which just says, low radiation is healthy? Question mark. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, and I think I'll just do those two first. Uh, and uh, Dr. Cutler, why don't you go ahead? Thank you very much. Um, I've been working on this for 25 years. Uh, this past year, I published a paper on the application of low dose ionizing radiation in medical therapies. I just published a paper this week on uh, treating Alzheimer's disease with CT scans of the brain. The radiation stimulates uh, protection systems, reverses oxidative damage, and patients become more cognition cognitive. Um, the, uh, we know that x-rays to the lungs can stop pneumonia, and we could prevent many of the deaths that have been happening. You had 500,000 deaths in the US, uh, a lot of them in uh, ICU because patients couldn't breathe. It was a problem of pneumonia. Uh, there are studies going on now. There's a study in uh, Emory University that showed that uh, and th these treatments were given in the early 1900s, uh, 1920s to 1940s, where they treated people with viral and uh, bacterial pneumonia, and they produced recoveries overnight. So uh, the problem is uh, people have been taught from the 1950s to fear radiation, to link it with cancer, and the physicians have not been looking or been discouraged from looking at the history of the past 120 years of uh, using low doses of radiation for treating a lot of diseases. Well, everyone uses it uh, for killing cancer tumors. Those are high doses that are focused. I'm talking about low doses uh, spread over a larger volume. Uh, they, they produce beneficial effects. I've got papers on that. I can give you references, links, they're all publicly available. Okay, thanks a lot. I'm going to now go, there's a couple of questions. There's a question for Nuclear New York. Please explain what is nuclear waste and can it be made less by reusing it? Of course, in part, Bruce went after that. I'm going to now, uh, if I just, just hold for a moment, I'm just going to try to get a couple of others out. Uh, carbon emissions are really CO2. Wouldn't CO2 be used up by vegetation? Anybody want to take that? You can take that, doctor. Okay, we'll come back to you for that. And let me just see if I can get a third. I just want to make sure we get a lot of these. Uh, and uh, Bruce is going to be for you. What about clean coal power generation over the old, older coal plants? And also, what about electrohydrodynamics? Okay, so why don't we go first to Eric, to you? You have something to say about that question? And then we'll go back to Dr. Cutler and then to Bruce. 
Sure. Um, I think uh, Bruce said uh, this more eloquently than I uh, could, but um, uh, basically uh, nuclear waste is dangerous because of its radioactivity, but the poison is in the dose, and that is the case with all energy output. Um, you know, if you're exposed to anything toxic in infinitesimal amounts, then you're fine. And if you're overexposed, then it's very harmful. Um, ultimately, nuclear waste is safe if it's behind thick enough concrete casks, and that is what it, it happens in the U.S. and every other country. Um, uh, as far as uh, what exactly is the precise uh, safe exposure rate, I think that's a more controversial uh question that you can look into and other people on the panel can contribute to. But, you know, whenever there's any kind of um, uh, trying to find the precise cause of cancer, it's always difficult. And especially if you look at like, you know, in Chernobyl, I mean, this is Ukraine in the 80s. There are coal plants everywhere. There's air pollution. Everybody's smoking and drinking. You know, there's all, all sorts of potential causes of cancer. So it's hard to be precise for the cause. Okay. Dr. Cutler? Um, what are we talking about? Cancer? Uh, well, that's one thing, but What's also... What's the first one you want me to touch on? Well, I just think the thing that should be... The I nuclear mean, just, waste? Uh, well, the nuclear waste thing, yeah, if you would say something about that. and Okay, also, look at the nuclear waste. What we're doing is we're taking a log, we're burning the bark, and we're calling the rest of it waste. That's not waste. What we're doing now is we're putting them in the shield containers and uh, nobody has ever been hurt by used fuel in those containers. You can stand beside it for the rest of your life and you won't see any harmful effects. So the only time you can get hurt is if you open up the container and eat the stuff. And we don't recommend that. So uh, this uh, volume is very small. And as you said, you can put it in football fields. You can put it on the surface. You don't have to put it 800 meters underground. People, uh, anti-nuclear people want to phase out nuclear energy. And the problem they're worried about is, what are we going to do with all these containers after we shut down all the plants? Well, the proper thing to do is to not to shut down the plants, to have nuclear sites, to have reactors, and to keep reusing the fuel. And uh, that doesn't fit the agenda of these anti-nuclear people. So they, they're harping about there's no solution to the problem of nuclear waste when in fact it's not, it's used fuel. There's 90% of it, more 95% useful energy in that stuff. And it's very easy to store it and nobody gets hurt from it. So it's not a problem. You think about the municipal waste that comes out of every home and the cities and where that gets put. And you look at the nuclear waste and it's a joke. You can put it in a small area. If you don't like the site, the optics, you can plant a forest around it of trees and it'll all look very nice. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an anti-nuclear issue and it's not a real health safety issue. That's uh, my position on that. Now, you want to know now, about- we, now, Well, let's go, hold on. Before you go to cancer, let me, let me put a question out here because it was one here from Jeanette. Uh, she says, I first taught on the East End when they had protests on Shoreham in the late 1970s, the Shoreham nuclear power plant in Long Island, uh, yeah. which by the way, was never opened. Um, I watched as countless people I knew got cancer. That area, in addition to the Brookhaven Labs property, still has carcinogenic material. That's, uh, let me tell you what happened. There was a high five reactor there, a heavy water reactor. Uh, they had a used fuel bay. There was cracks in the bay. A bit of water from the uh, cooling of the used fuel got into the ground. It, the water had a bit of tritium in it. The water, the plume never went outside the boundaries of Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, when they shut down the reactor, they, they moved the fuel and they took out the water. They put the water in tankers. They shipped it to Canada. It went to Darlington plant. We have a tritium removal facility. When we looked at the amount of tritium in that water, it was so low, it wasn't worth uh, removing the tritium. We just dumped it in Lake Ontario. Uh, th this whole scare is uh, ridiculous. Okay. Do you but understand you know, what I mean? It, it's I, yeah, emotional. you just... You, you just were clear about, since you knew about it in detail, 
I remember cars. exactly when it happened, and I was there when the trucks arrived, and I saw them look at this and said, this is ridiculous. This is not the, we produce a lot of heavy water in Canada. We have a very high concentration, 20 curies per kilogram in the moderator, one curie per kilogram in the heat transport system. Uh, we manage our tritium. We remove some of it from the water. Uh, we have releases in the environment. The releases are very, very small and tritium is not much of a hazard. And uh, we have drinking water standards and we comply with them all. So tritium is not a problem. And what was in the ground at Shoreham at, at uh, Brookhaven was trivial. Okay, so Bruce, I had, I, uh, can wait, you- Wait, wait, there's a, one other yeah. thing. Uh, cosmic radiation produces tritium in the environment, up in the atmosphere, and it comes down and goes into the lakes. So now you have to look at how much tritium is in the lakes from natural causes. People don't complain about anything that's naturally occurring. It's only the human-made stuff. And when you look at it, the human-made stuff is not very big. Okay. So, Bruce? Okay. Are you well, yeah, go ahead. You had a, there was a question about coal. Right. What about clean coal power generation over the older coal plants and also electrohydrodynamics? They asked them both. Uh, both. Okay. Uh, most of the coal plants have been going through refurbishing as well. I worked on a couple of them uh, where, you know, we built in scrubbers and other technology to upgrade the systems to reduce ash and reduce uh, sulfur and things like that. I mean, that's fine. You, you, you know, you can, um, you can do that. You can, you can always find a technological solution for a problem. You know, you just have to come up with it. Um, you know, there was another question as well. Uh, Electrohydrodynamics. Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not exactly sure uh, what they're referring to, the, the Magnetohydrodynamics, possibly. Yeah, that's what that's probably what he they, he actually means. Also, yeah. there was a question about fracking, which just said, "What about fracking?" So that's another one, which I had not asked you before. Do you have anything on that? Um, well, the fracking thing—it's really not, you know, it's it's really not economical, and it's 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 pretty bad, you know. Um, the the only reason they were really going into that. As an, it was a more of an investment strategy, was to try to, uh, if, the, if the price of oil in that was high enough, it would make it worthwhile to do that. But where the price of energy is kept down, then it's not feasible. It's not economical to frack, and it's, it's pretty uh, damaging, really, fracking. Uh, the magnetohydrodynamics part of it, I'm not really uh, that up on it, other than there are ways to get electrical uh, production directly out of burning processes. Um, other than that, I could, the uh, doctor hey, might know a little more about it than I do. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Cutler, you want to say anything or... Well, uh, that would be something uh, where you create a plasma, and that's pretty mm -hmm. high temperature stuff uh, to yeah. uh, run a plasma between uh, in a magnetic field and pull out energy. But um, my God, we have very good generators, um, turbine generators. Well, I don't know why anyone would look at that technology. Yeah, I, I wanted to say something about that, Doc, because it's actually get us in a transition since we pretty much come to the end of our time. We're going to have everybody do summary remarks, anything that people have not had a chance to say yet, they would like to add. But I'd like to say one something about what you just said and something which is of some relevance as a whole. Um, it is relevant for us to look at the idea of where the world and where the United States is going to be in the next 50 years. Some of us who got involved in these fights around nuclear power, such as myself and others who were you know, uh, back in 1974, this is to go through it, when the Fusion Energy Foundation was founded, we were talking about thermonuclear fusion. But the concept was that you, because you were going to be developing advanced technologies through research and development and new generations of nuclear power, 
what you would do is you would use your, your fossil fuel and related resources to the maximum because you were going to be bringing new forms of technology online. And as you brought these new forms of technology online, you phased out older uh, 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 forms that were less energy dense. Uh, and that was the idea, that the idea of what's happened, for example, in the improvements of nuclear power plant design since Chernobyl or since uh, Three Mile Island, 33 years into the future from 1978, that means that in 2013, we built no nuclear power plants in the United States in the entire time of which we have built 104 before. I mean, so, so the levels of, uh, the way to think about this, I think, is that there's an envelope of the future. You could talk about 10, 15, 20 years. You could talk about an Apollo project for energy. You could, you could, you could put it a lot of different ways, but clearly advanced technologies should be looked at as research and development capabilities that are an envelope within which you take technologies that clearly work, which we've just talked about, and you use those tech capabilities. Uh, with respect to this idea of, of, of what people have talked about, about uh, and you know, a lot of us are not worried about carbon emissions, frankly, we think that plants like CO2. We also think that CO2 is not a pollutant, it's an element. So that's another element. But even if you didn't believe that, clearly nuclear technology, because of its nature, is not, uh, does not provide all sorts of problems, I'll put it like that, that are going to be able to be solved. So I think as we, we come to a concluding sort of point, I'd like for everybody just if there's anything you heard that you want to respond to, either from any of the other speakers or uh, anything that you think needs to be said, please feel free to do so. And I guess I'm going to do it kind of relatively randomly, uh, but just ask, I'll start with Nick Cochler first. Sure. A uh, couple things, Dennis. Uh, Dr. Cochler, he mentioned about the low radiation uh, papers that he's written. I remember reading things, I believe it was in uh, the EIR magazine from uh, the nuclear, uh, Zbigniew something, he was head of the United Nations Atomic Energy Radiation Committee. And he had several articles, uh, it's in your archives, I, I would imagine, uh, about similar things, how uh, the scare about uh, the thyroid cancers was really way overblown, very limited. So that was just one resource uh, one thing I'd like to say, and then quickly, I also uh, would like to mention that uh, we're talking about economics, of course, and Diane said, you know, we can't think about money uh, in its normal sense that most people do, but it's going to take an effort to either refurbish what we have now until we can build on to something uh, forward like uh, you mentioned that the four plants here in Illinois are, are slated to be gone. Uh, there's a chance that the Illinois legislature uh, will come to the rescue. A lot of people will hate it, but it might be the thing to do for now so we can keep the energy going uh, until the future unfolds if there's enough effort to get higher forms of density higher forms of uh, energy flux out. So thank you. Thanks everybody for this uh, discussion tonight. It's been great. Okay, thank you. Mayor Knickerbocker. I think you're muted. Okay, there I am. Yeah. So I just wanted to comment on the spent fuel or, or the unused fuel that sits there. Um, <sighs> There was a policy, the US policy started with President Carter years and years and years ago. And it seemed like after that, that was the policy that was kept. So other countries like France, for example, refurbishes the spent fuel. Like, so, you know, people complain about the waste of nuclear power plants, but if the policy was changed where that, that fuel could be refurbished, well, that would, that would solve that problem. So that's something else people way higher up on the, on the food chain there have to have a discussion about. And, you know, what do we do with the, the spent fuel from these plants? Do we refurbish it or we just let it sit there and try to find a place to put it, to put it. Okay. Eric. 
Yeah. Um, well, thank you to Diane again for putting this together. Um, and uh, I, I, it always warms my heart uh, to uh, uh, talk about nuclear with uh, people from diverse backgrounds and see everybody's uh, different take. And I always learn something new whenever attending meetings like this. Um, and uh, especially in an era when there's such political tribalism, it's nice to you know just hear different perspectives and, and go back and forth. Um, the other thing I would say based on economics, a lot of the arguments against nuclear and even for nuclear are based on uh, economic models that make a lot of assumptions that may or may not be accurate. And so I would just say in the broad big picture, um, my goal and I think everybody's goal should be to convince a broad swath of the broad middle class to want nuclear. And if that happens, then the subsidies and the investment will come. But ultimately, we need to convince just average people, hey, this is safe. This is clean and it's efficient. So we, we should expand. Okay, very good. Bruce? Um, I don't know if I really have anything more to add on it. Um, again, I would just say if we look at what just happened with this Mars landing and you apply that concept to the issue of nuclear power, you can see that there's a solution there. If we can do something as dramatic as that, as you know, as dramatic as going 400 million miles and landing at, uh, auto, on autopilot, let's put it that way, where you don't have the ability to directly control, but using remote sensing can, then you can see that we can, whether it's nuclear waste, or the, the way that the newest type nuclear plants can function, you can see the, that we can solve those problems. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Dr. Cutler. Well, uh, I'm trying to compare the situation with Canada and the US and the state of New York, uh, Indian Point. Uh, the province, the people of Ontario own those reactors and they hire companies to operate them and they guarantee that the company will not go bankrupt. They give them a guaranteed price. This company can now borrow money, refurbish to whatever is necessary to operate the plant and produce power. And it turns out that the cost isn't that uh, uh, extraordinary. It's uh, the order of eight cents a kilowatt hour. Now, if, if ent energy is not operating in, in the interest of your state, uh, really, uh, you should own the plant yourself. These, the state of New York should own the plant and hire an operating company to operate it and work out a deal with the gas private companies on uh, how much or how much they're going to get paid. But you've got to be sure whoever's operating your nuclear plant that they are not going to go bankrupt. You've got to guarantee them a certain share of the market at a certain price. That's what we did in Canada and our plants are operating beautifully, 90%, no concerns, we're refurbishing whenever we need. And uh, so you've got to take ownership of it because uh, the private companies are doing their own deals and uh, they're, they're under pressure from competitors. And uh, so there's nothing, when the price of the plant goes down that Entergy wants to give it to Holtec at a bargain price. You might as well buy it and keep it running. Do, okay. you, do you understand where I'm coming from? Yes, we. I think we got you very clearly. <laughs> okay, very good. Don't so shut Diane? it down. Buy it and run it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like that idea very much. And I was really heartened to hear about the plants that you guys got opened after having... 10 after years having, it was sitting exactly. there. Yeah. And uh, a company came in, Bruce Power. They were an operating company, not an owner. And they signed a deal with the owner. And they said, you guarantee us this price. We'll go out and borrow the money and we'll refurbish it and we'll operate it. And by golly, they did it. Yep. No, we absolutely cannot give up on this. I think the thing that happened with Shoreham was so hideous it's like one of these things where you see an act of violence and it's gut-wrenching because you have a plant that's built 
I watched a little documentary about this and I heard a speech that Mario Cuomo gave and it really, and he said, and we're going to peel the sheet metal off the wall. I mean, like, we're going to stop this. We are going to crush Hollywood it. Hollywood actors. We're, yeah. You've got to communicate facts. You got well, to There are facts about health effects of radiation. There are facts about the technology and uh, you've got to deal with that information. If you're dealing with myths and assumptions and hypotheses, uh, then uh, you can't win the battle. Right. At any rate, so this this has to be reversed. And uh, I was thinking about two things. One is the question of increasing energy density and extremely dense forms of energy, like the idea of a plasma torch, or getting so much heat potentially that you could even break things down into their original elements, which if we, that, that, that's future, we get to that point that's future technology but right exactly. today you need uh, you need to put electricity into your homes and uh, we <laughs> no, have technology but, you got to keep running those hundred plants then you build new ones this next state of the art and the reason they're building a lot of new ones is it's too expensive to build uh, the conventional ones so they're building new ones that are smaller because they're affordable it's the only game in town you right, saw what but, happened uh, to the big reactors you're building. They went way over budget and schedule. There's too much regulation. There's too much fear. You've got to control that. Well, that's why people, I, I think it was China that was looking at investing in high-speed rail in this country, and they ran away from it because they said, we're going to spend billions of dollars on environmental studies, and we'll never get a shovel in the ground to build the thing. That's but. Right. Uh, the point of thinking of something that's in the future, I mean, if you had that kind of intensity, then virtually anything that we consider waste now could be recycled. There, would no, there wouldn't be such a thing as waste. Yes, the future is there, but you also have to protect the present. Right, but the way that you end up in the right direction is you have to have a future point in mind. You can't just stumble around taking arbitrary steps in any old direction. You've got to have a plan, you're right. Yeah. So, and I think one thing we need urgently in the United States, we have not built a new city since, I guess, Las Vegas, which is unfortunate, but it had to do, it had to do with infrastructure. But, you know, we actually should have science cities. And then you see the virtue of nuclear power. You don't have to have a river. You don't have to have some outside thing. You can plop your plant down in, in this area. Yeah, and you can build an entire city around it and you can actually have a conception of a city with a city culture that has a specific purpose. Like you know the Pickering uh, nuclear, nuclear plant, we built it, it was outside Toronto, the city grew around it. The distance is a hundred, a thousand yards from a person's backyard to the edge of the plant. One thousand yards, so that's it's less than a mile. It's really close. People look out their backyard and they see the nuclear plant. Eight reactors operating. And they're, they're very safe. And they're licensed. When the, uh, when the Oyster Creek nuclear plant used to run, I only live a mile away. And in the winter, when there's no leaves on the trees, I used to hear the speaker system where they'd be talking, the plant operators would be talking to different parts of the plant. And I could hear it from my house. So there's no need to have all this fear. We've got to deal with the fear. Yes, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, yes. unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes efforts uh, needed to convert retreat into advance. I think somebody said that one time. Roosevelt, was it? <laughs> I think it was him. Yeah. All right, so Diane, you have anything else or are we now concluded? No, I think we can conclude. I'd like to thank everybody again. Uh, I think next Friday's discussion, we're going to take up the uh, woman on Mars, the Mars missions. And probably a couple of weeks from now, we'll have more on this nuclear power question because it's a big one. And I think our nation better straight, get straight on it pretty quickly or we're going to see something much worse than what we just saw in Texas. Okay, so then for people who are interested, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, you can uh, catch uh, us at uh, 
the Schiller Institute, there'll be another meeting tomorrow or econo economic round table. Uh, and then, uh, as Diane said, we'll do this show uh, next Friday uh, on the Mars mission and reflections on that. Also, if there are questions, there may be other questions that, because I see some are still coming in. If we didn't get to them, we'll forward them to whomever you wish to take them. Uh, and we will encourage everybody to, of course, uh, write us if there's anything else that we need to consider. So on behalf of the New York Symposium with Diane Siri, we want to thank everybody for joining us and we'll see you next week.